Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your presence in this place. I thank you that even as you showed me this morning that there are shackles that you want to remove from people. Shackles that stop them from progressing. Shackles of stagnation. I thank you, God, that this morning revelation will be imparted. This message will not be limited to information, but revelation will be imparted that will transform our lives and take us to our next level. I thank you, God, that your angels are being activated right now on behalf of your people. Even as your word tells us that angels are ministering spirits ready to serve, to minister to those who are to receive salvation. I thank you, God, for what you are doing in this place. Thank you for the worship in this household of faith. Thank you that the name of Jesus was lifted up this morning. Thank you that you inhabit the praises of the saints. Holy Spirit, you're so welcome. You're our teacher. Come and teach us. Come and take from what is Jesus's and give it to us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Are you ready this morning, City Life Church? Yes. Are you expectant this morning, City Life Church? Yes. The Bible tells us that anything which is not from faith is sin. So whenever you listen to a message, you must listen in faith. Yes. Believing that God wants to speak to me. Yes. Amen. Amen. God has brought me here by appointment. It's that mentality. Amen. Amen. The title of my message is The Technology of Supernatural Wisdom. The technology of what? Supernatural wisdom. How many of you know that you are always building? Either by design or by default, you are always building. But what material are you going to use? One of the things that happened when we moved to Centurion in 2010, we realized that if you want to build in that area or if you want to purchase a house, you have to be aware of something called dolomite. You all know what dolomite is, right? And what happens if you build a house on dolomite, but you don't take care of the foundation? You have problems. Your house could collapse. Amen? Amen. Now we see that scripturally, we must always take care in how we build, particularly the foundation. And I've said to you earlier on that you are always building. Whether by design or by default, you're building. I'm speaking to everyone here as a leader. You're leaders. Leaders are people who influence. Amen? Amen. Leaders are people who influence. Leadership is not about position. Leadership is about influence. Yeah. And you're all influencers, whether it's with your children, whether it's at the school, university, wherever you're at, you're influencing. Now, leaders are social architects. Say the person next to you, social architect. Leaders are social architects. An architect designs physical things, but as a leader, you're a social architect. You create climate. But I want you to know this morning that the climate that you create, the atmosphere you create, is primarily based on wisdom, because wisdom builds. Now, there are two sources of wisdom. You can either get wisdom from above, wisdom from God, supernaturally, or you can rely on the wisdom of men, which is ultimately demonic wisdom. Are you hearing me this morning? Amen. All right. There are only two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, and there's no demilitarized zone. <laughs> Amen. Come on. Come on. How many of you studied history? Yeah. Right? Do you remember the Rhineland? between Germany and France, all right? We've been watching, we've been watching World War II in color, okay? There's that, that series with our kids, and our kids have been asking us all sorts of questions. And then they say, but Dad, isn't this violent for us? Oh, it's interesting, son, it's interesting. But Dad, isn't this a bit violent? No, but it's real, it's, it's, it's history, so it's okay, we can watch it, okay? <laughs> but the point I'm making, I'm just owning up, just being honest, all right? But there was the Rhineland in between Germany and France, and for some time, it was a demilitarized zone. So you would find the soldiers there playing cricket with each other around Christmas time, okay? It was a demilitarized zone. But in the spirit realm, there's no demilitarized zone. There's no neutral zone. You can think to yourself, ah, no, I don't believe in spiritual warfare. Just because you don't believe in it doesn't mean you can't be taken out. Amen. Amen. Just because you're in denial doesn't mean you can't be taken out. It's like a cricket game happening, you know, and people are, are, are bowling fast, and you're just standing there, and you're not aware it's a game of cricket. You can be hit on the head. Amen? Amen. 
And so I want you to know this morning, there are two types of wisdom. There's wisdom from above, wisdom from God, and then there's wisdom that's ultimately demonic. My question to you is, how are you building? You see, God is a king, and every king has a kingdom. There's a nature of kingdoms. Every kingdom has a language. Every kingdom has a wisdom. That's why scripture tells us that Babylon, there was the wisdom of Babylon. And these guys, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were given the understanding of the wisdom of Babylon by God. Okay? So a kingdom has a wisdom. A kingdom has laws, bylaws, constitutions. Kingdoms have territory. And there are many Christians today saying, I'm a citizen of God's kingdom. But what grieves the Lord is are you functioning by the wisdom of the kingdom? You see, if we want to inject God's kingdom into this earth, because the kingdom of God is not going, it's coming. Amen? Jesus, when he teaches us to pray, he says, pray, thy kingdom come. Primarily, we do that by manifesting the wisdom of God into the nations. Are you hearing me this morning? Say, I hear you. Thank you. All right? So you are building, whether it's by design or by default, Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 to 11. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise master builder. And someone else is building on it. But each one must be careful how he builds. So this thing that we call building, the word in the Greek for it is a very powerful word. It's the word oiko, which means house, domeo. So it's about building a house, as it were. And that word for house could be a family. It could be a household, all right? But it's not necessarily something physical. And so we are building it. It literally means to strengthen, to build, or to encourage. And you do it primarily with your words and how you are, what you carry as a person. Is everyone following this morning? All right? Now, someone once said, I teach what I know. Consciously, I teach what I know. Unconsciously, I pass on who I am. So you can only impart what's inside of you. You can only impart what you have. And God in this time and in this hour is calling us to build, but by his wisdom. And whatever you have placed in you, whatever you've fed yourself with, when God takes you to your next level, your diet changes, your spiritual diet changes, what you eat changes. We learn to make the basics beautiful with God's word, but we also tap into a deeper level of God. Amen? Amen. We pursue wisdom. And what is happening here is it says, but each one must be careful how he builds. That's why I'm preaching this message. If you where I live, you have to be careful how you build, unless you, because you might end up building on dolomite, and your house might come crashing down if you don't have those special raft foundations that they talk about. Amen? My question to you is, how are you building? And you see, how you build isn't apparent. On the outside, it can look a certain way. I remember going into a house initially, and we thought, thought, oh, this is a stunning, beautiful house, large, massive house, and we were really excited about it. And then at a certain point, we wanted to put pictures up. So you get the drill, and you start drilling, and it just goes shoop, into the wall. And we realized, wait a minute, this house is really great, but the downstairs wall, the material that was used to build it, the people were taking shortcuts. This thing needs to be fixed. Amen. Have you ever been in that situation where something looks nice on the outside, then you realize, wait a minute, the sand that they used or whatever mixture they used, there's something that they skipped here. Each one must be careful how they build. Let's go a little bit deeper. I find it interesting because Paul describes himself as a wise master builder. And it's interesting because that word wise or wisdom, it's the word sophos. That's where you get the name Sophia from. Any Sophias here? Yes. All right. Okay. But an interesting thing is that word wise is also the word skilled. So whenever we're talking about wisdom from above, we're not talking about something theoretical. Amen? We're not talking about some wise shaman who lives on top of a mountain and is no earthly good. 
We're not talking about theories. We're talking about something that is practical. Someone once said, wisdom is not just knowing what to do. Wisdom is knowing what to do next. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. Just because you have lots of knowledge doesn't mean you're wise. Amen? Amen. And as I go through this, I see something powerful. So the word wise, that word Sophia, and then the word master builder, it's the word architecton. Architecton. That's obviously where we get the word architect from. Amen. Amen. And Sophia married an architect, right? <laughs> it's very prophetic. Everything is prophetic here, right? And that word architecton, it's an interesting word because it basically means the first carpenter or the ruling carpenter or the ruling designer. So Paul describes himself as, I'm, I'm the first or the foundational designer here and I'm building in the spirit. Are you following? You are always building. And God has made us master designers. You cannot separate wisdom from design. You cannot separate wisdom from building. The material that we use in the kingdom of God to build is wisdom. But by what wisdom are you building? Kingdom of darkness or kingdom of light? You see, wisdom becomes a spiritual asset for me. You can say to me, Paul, I'll give you a million bucks. I'll give you a million US dollars, Paul, right? Or, or do you want wisdom? I'd rather have the wisdom. Because with wisdom, I can get everything else. Amen? Amen? One of the things I find amazing in Second Chronicles, we have the account of King Solomon. I like to call it an account, not a story. Because when we keep saying stories, the story in the Bible, the story in the Bible, our kids grow up with a mindset of stories are fiction. Right? This is an account. It's something that happened. And what is interesting is that Solomon is asked by God, what do you want? I believe the Lord is asking each and every person here in this room, what do you want? What do you want? Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? We think when we go before God, we have to twist his arm for stuff. No. He's saying, what do you want? What do you want me to do for you? When Jesus met blind Bartimaeus. As Jesus was walking out of Jericho, walking to Jericho, he meets blind Bartimaeus, and what does he say? He could see that the guy is blind, but he still asks him, what do you want? That's his heart for you this morning. What do you want? And what is interesting is that Solomon said, I'm leading such a great number of people that have been given to me by my father. How can I do this? I need wisdom. And that request pleased the Lord. How many of you know that there are requests that please the Lord? There are levels when it comes to prayer. There are things he likes us to ask him for. And God then responds and he says, because you have not asked for wealth, because you have not asked for me to kill off all your enemies, yeah? Because you haven't asked for all these other things. You know what? I'm going to give you this wisdom, but I'm also going to give you honor and I'm going to give you wealth and riches and honor like no other king has ever had in history. Isn't that wonderful? My question to you is, what are you asking God for? It says God appeared to him in a dream. That was an impartation. A lot of times when the Lord appears to you in a dream, it's not just a vision. He's actually appearing and imparting something to you. Some of you say, I had a dream about such and such and such happening to me when the thing was actually happening to you. You understand what I'm saying? There's impartation and there's activation that can happen while you're sleeping. Because very often when you're sleeping, you're not all in your head questioning God and saying, oh, I refuse this, I refuse that. Amen? Amen. What was interesting was that God was pleased with this request, but it's a request that stemmed from a humble heart. Solomon started off by saying, who can lead this group of people? In other words, he was not trusting in his own strength, but he was trusting in God's heart. I'm speaking to you this morning on the technology of supernatural wisdom. In order for us to gain supernatural wisdom, we have to come to the end of ourselves. We have to come to a place of brokenness that says, God, you know what? I can't do this in my own strength. I need wisdom from you. One of the quickest ways to short circuit the wisdom of God is to rely on your own flesh and your own wisdom. Amen? And when you open your, when you do that, when you rely on the flesh long enough, you open yourself to the other source of wisdom, which is demonic. Amen? How many of you know that leaders of nations, rulers of nations today, a lot of them have demonic counsel. They're not aware of it. Some of you went to university with some of them and you're thinking, why are they doing this? Why did they make that decision concerning the economy? Demonic counsel, that's what's happening. Wasn't this the guy who got distinctions when we were studying economics together? Demonic counsel. Amen? 
Just because you have knowledge doesn't mean you have wisdom. Amen. Some nations on the African continent, you can, you, it's difficult to even count on your fingers the number of degrees some of the cabinet ministers have. Come on, some of you know those nations, right? Some of you are from those nations. Or should I say some of us, <laughs> right? Praise God, you can tell from my surname, those of you who don't know me. Nyamunda, by the way, means one who loves all others. So my surname isn't Nyamunda. Some people like to say Nyamunda because it's easier to say, but it's Nyamunda. It's one who loves all others. Nyamunda is the owner of a farm. That's what it means, Nyamunda. Who would you rather be? One who loves all others, owner of a farm. <laughs> all right. So we see some powerful principles here. He says, but each one must be careful how he builds, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. What's your foundation? There's a lot of dolomite in the world. I'm now speaking metaphorically. What foundation are you going to build on? Because if it's not on Christ, it will be on the dolomite. What is amazing about the wisdom of God is you apply it to all aspects of life. You see, some people think these are just so-called spiritual principles. So they're like, when I'm in church, then I'll apply all these principles. But then when I go to work, it's a different story. Business is business, Paul. Business is business. I'm not a Christian anymore. I'm now just doing business. doesn't work that way. Amen? We've made the mistake of separating the sacred from the secular. But how many think that God is interested in all of life? I don't know about you, but I have a problem with Christians who are what we call religious weird. You know, it's fine if someone is weird in general, if they're weird in church and weird outside of church. I get that. I understand. But there's some Christians who are religious weird. You know what I'm talking about? The person is very normal when you're with them at Woolies or at Steers or wherever you go. All right? KFC. I was just, my kids told me it's, that's Kids Fattening Center. But anyway, <laughs> KFC. Regardless of wherever you go, they're very normal. But now when you're in church, all of a sudden they're speaking in King James, right? And you don't get them. I'm not talking about that type of wisdom. I'm talking about a wisdom that you can apply to all of life. Amen. Amen. Let's go a little bit deeper. I like what Charles Spurgeon said. You all know Charles Spurgeon, right? From the 1800s, one of the greatest preachers of all time. He says, wisdom is the right use of knowledge. Wisdom is the right use of knowledge. To know is not to be wise. See, this, this is the deception. A lot of people think because they know a lot of things, they're wise. You know that the biblical word for knowing, often when it says to know Christ, right? It's a word that literally talks about an intimate and experiential knowing. So just because you know about something doesn't mean you know. But what is interesting here is, let me finish off the quote, to know is not to be wise. Many men know a great deal and are all the greater fools for it. There is no fool so great a fool as a knowing fool. But to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. To know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. To know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. So when you're next praying, say, God, thank you for the knowledge that you're giving me. Give me understanding. Give me wisdom so I know how to use this knowledge. Someone once said to me, wisdom is not just knowing what to do. Wisdom is knowing what to do next. One of the things I've seen with a lot of Christians is God speaks to them about their lives. And they're like, wow, I've got a wonderful destiny. Then they try to do everything at once. Instead of asking themselves, what's my next step? Amen? We have to understand the times and the seasons, like the sons of Issachar. Jesus says, why don't you be like the sons of Issachar who understood the times and the seasons? You guys understand that when it's stormy, when a storm is brewing up, you know it's about to rain. And it's like that in this season, in this nation, isn't it? You know when it's raining. Do you think it will rain? My love, will it rain today? Do you, uh, oh, let's look at the cloud cover. Jesus says, you guys know how to do this, but why don't you understand the seasons? And seasons are not just seasons of nations. They're not just seasons of regions. They often are seasons in your own life. I mean, if you know that our lives happen in seasons, amen? amen? Our lives happen in moments, our lives happen in seasons. What's for now? What's for now? And the people who know this are the people who are wise. Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen? All right. So I want to talk to you about the technology of supernatural wisdom. Technology is a fancy word for a system or a logic or the inner workings of something. Everything has a technology. 
It comes from two words, techne and logia, all right? It's basically talking about the inner workings of a craft or an art. Everything has technology. This microphone I'm using, there's a technology to it. Now, a lot of Christians know that they are citizens of the kingdom of God, but haven't grasped the technology of the kingdom. Are you hearing me this morning? The kingdom of God has a technology. The kingdom of God is God's way of doing what he does. That's the kingdom. And there are a lot of things around us that are not kingdom, and our job is to infect and to inject kingdom life into those things. Amen. When you're sick in your body, your primary thing should be, God, what does kingdom look like? I inject and I infect my present circumstances with the kingdom of God. Simple as that. The first principle in the technology of supernatural wisdom is that Christ is our wisdom. You don't have to look anywhere else for wisdom. Go to Christ. Christ is enough for me. Amen? Amen. Colossians 2 verse 2 to 3 says, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches, not half riches, the full riches of what? Some of you are thinking cash immediately, right? When I said full riches, right? Because that's the space you're in right now. So they may have the full riches of complete understanding. Have you noticed that when someone is strong on business acumen, that means they have a wisdom around business. You can take away their business, but what happens? They still bounce back. They can become bankrupt, but they still bounce back because they have the wisdom that they need to build a business. Amen. Wisdom builds. Wisdom builds. Say to the person next to you, wisdom builds. By what wisdom are you building? Let's carry on. Let's look at it a bit further. It says, in whom? We're talking about Christ. It says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. These are spiritual assets. No one can take it away from you. You know, it's amazing how we grab things in life and we are afraid that this will be taken from me. No one can take your wisdom from you. It's a spiritual asset. The Bible tells us that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Have you ever asked yourself, what are those spiritual blessings? One of them is the spirit of wisdom. And no one can take it from you. No one can take it from you. I find it interesting because it says Christ is our wisdom. Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If I say to you, I've got a million bucks for you, but I've hidden it, and I've hidden it at Monte Cassino, what's the first thing you're going to do? You will leave this service right now, right? You will leave the service. You'll say, I'll catch the rest on video. You'll, you'll leave it, and you'll go to Monte Cassino. That's where you will look. My question to you is, where are you looking for wisdom? Where are you looking for wisdom? I don't care what ism it is. There are only two kingdoms. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. There's no demilitarized zone. Where are you looking for wisdom? How are you building right now? How are you building your household, your family? Is it based on wisdom and traditions of men? Remember, Jesus says, you guys, you are nullifying the word of God because you are building your lives on the traditions of men. We must look at the traditions of men. We must look at our culture and we must say, what am I going to take from my culture and from my family traditions that are kingdom? I will take them and the rest I'll spit out. Amen? I find it amazing as a pastor, sometimes you give people advice. You say, do this, do this, according to the word of God. Two weeks later, they come back to you and they say, oh, and they've done the opposite. And you say, why did you do the opposite? Oh, yeah, my auntie said we must do this. Or in our culture, we have to do this. Do you know what that shows me? The epistemology of a lot of people, epistemology is just a fancy word of how we know what we know, right? For how we know what we know. The epistemology of a lot of people is actually the wisdom of the fathers as opposed to the word of God. Amen. By what wisdom are you building? By what wisdom are you building? Often I counsel couples. I counsel a lot of families. And I'll deal with a couple in a certain way. And we feel like we're on the same page. And then I find them coming some weeks later. And they're in a crisis. And I say, what happened? Yeah, well, we first, we went to our auntie. And I'm like, okay, I was counseling you all this time. Now you went to your auntie. And what did your auntie tell you? And often it's not word-based. 
By what wisdom are you building? By what wisdom are you building? Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. It says, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. Who is your wisdom? Christ. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Nothing can destroy a person who has access to the wisdom of God. Nothing can destroy a person who has access to the wisdom of God. My question to you is, are you open to that wisdom or are you short-circuiting that wisdom? Are you open to supernatural wisdom or have you short-circuited it? And I'm going to show you how we do that. Okay? I like what Sir Francis Bacon said. He's a guy, clever guy, philosopher from back in the day, 1500s, 1600s from England. He says, our humanity were a poor thing but for the divinity that stirs within us. Our humanity were a poor thing, but, but for the divinity that stirs within us. We are nothing apart from Christ. Am I going to trust my own intellect and all the things I've studied, or is my trust going to be in supernatural wisdom from above? Number two. Supernatural wisdom must be pursued. You see, when something is hidden, you must look for it. It doesn't come to you on a silver platter. How many of you were looking for your keys this morning? Or from time to time this week? Come on, just own up. You've been, you were looking for your keys. I want to say to the people at home, i.e. my family members, don't expose anyone. But I keep saying, guys, there must never be a temporary landing spot for anything. You know what I'm talking about. Keys must always stay in the keyhole. Otherwise, you waste a lot of time looking for things. But how many of you know that the times when you are looking for your keys, you'll search this place, you'll then search this place, and you'll search that place. You know what? Jesus loves it when we pursue him. The Bible tells us that it's the glory of a king to search out a matter. Wisdom has to be pursued. Wisdom is not something that just falls to you. It's something that you seek. You seek God's face. You press in deep and you say, Lord, give me understanding. Give me revelation concerning this passage. Even if it means spending hours on the particular passage, it's the glory of kings to search out a matter. Amen? Amen. Very often when the Lord teaches us things, he teaches us in response to questions that we ask. I always say this, it's important for great leaders to know how to ask questions that get to the heart of a matter. You know, one of the things I love doing, I always say to my circle of friends, I'm the best question asker I know. Because when you ask someone a question that they've never been asked before, you get them to think about things they've never thought of before. And when they think about things they've never thought of before, they end up saying things they never said before. And when people say things they never said before because your tongue is the rudder, they end up doing things they've never done before. Amen? That's the power of asking questions. If you look in Scripture, you'll notice what happens with Jesus. He doesn't just say, okay, guys, let me teach you the Our Father. Here's how it goes. What happens? He gave that teaching in response to a question asked. When was the last time you asked the Lord a question? Wisdom is something that you seek. Wisdom is something that you pursue and is found in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. And he wants to answer. When he talks here about this is hidden, hidden all the treasures of the wisdom and knowledge of God. You know what? He, Christ doesn't hide things from you permanently. What does he do? His joy is to reveal it to you. He only hides it so that he can reveal it to you. It's like Christmas presents. We wrap them, don't we? Why? Because of the joy of unwrapping. When you give your favorite person, my wife often calls me her favorite person. Hallelujah. How many of you are someone's favorite? <laughs> so some people are now checking out, am I your favorite, honey? Am I? Your... Yes. By faith. Yes. No jokes. All right. But with your favorite people, when you surprise them with something, you hide it only for the joy of surprise. And that's what he does. The mysteries in the kingdom of God are hidden so that we search out a matter. We pursue Christ. And what happens? Only for the joy of him revealing it to us. Isn't that awesome? Okay. So have a look, have a look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8. It says, among the mature, however, we speak a message of wisdom. So the immature don't grasp the message of wisdom. Amen. That already screens a number of people. Who's been screened by that one? Okay. <laughs> Among the mature. Say, I'm mature. I'm mature. By faith. 
Amen. Among, I just didn't want you to be conning, so I just, you just say by faith, you know. <laughs> Among the mature, however, we speak a message of wisdom. It doesn't say a clever message. It doesn't say an intellectual message. It doesn't say a message that makes people think we're so clued up. It says a message of wisdom, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age. So why are we surprised when economies fail? Because people and leaders are not often building on God's wisdom. So why are we surprised? I don't care what ism you call it. If it's not kingdom, it doesn't last. If you look in the book of Hebrews, it talks about how we're going to be building on the unshakable. It talks about a kingdom that's unshakable. It says they're the shakable things and they're the unshakable. And when the shaking comes, the shakable things will shake. What is shakable in your life? We might not be able to see it right now. We might look at you and think, wow, you're looking so fine. You're an FLBB. I was the one who coined that phrase some years ago. You all know what an FLBB is, right? Uh, fine looking black brother, right? I coined it some years ago, right? You're an FLBB. You look nice on the outside, but by what wisdom are you building? Proverbs 3, verse 13, it says here, yeah, blessed are those who find wisdom. So you have to pursue it. Those who gain understanding. When Jesus was asked about taxes, and he said the whole thing of like, well, whose, whose head is on that money? That was, that was a word of wisdom he got on the spot. I don't think Jesus had been thinking about it before and so on, but he was functioning by supernatural wisdom when he said that. Amen. When Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness by the devil, and we say he kept on quoting the word of God, that was the spirit of wisdom in operation because he was applying knowledge of the word to a specific context. You see, many people knew those very same scriptures that Jesus had quoted, but few people would have been able to apply them in spiritual warfare, which that was, contextually. That's why Jesus says, you know what? The Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance all that I've taught you. What is that? What is going on there? That is wisdom. There's knowledge that Jesus would have taught you, and he says the Holy Spirit will bring it to remembrance. When I'm doing what? When I'm in a situation where I need that particular word. But how many of you know that you have to have been with Jesus? The Holy Spirit can't bring to remembrance what you didn't know in the first place. So you study to gain knowledge, and the Holy Spirit gives you remembrance of the knowledge so you can apply it, and applied knowledge is wisdom. So what is my definition of wisdom? Apostolic wisdom is the application of knowledge, intuition, and experience with a resultant building and good judgment. Amen? Can I say it again? Apostolic wisdom is the application of your knowledge, your intuition, and your, and your experience, however much of it you have, with a resultant good judgment and good building. That's what it is. Some people think just because they're old, automatically they've got wisdom. We know a lot of old people who do foolish things. Amen? Amen. Wisdom is applic application of the knowledge. I know a lot of people who become bitter and bitter and bitter and more bitter the older they get. They don't become wiser. May we become wiser the older we become. Amen. Amen. In Ephesians 3, it's very powerful. It says here, from verse 10 to 11, his intent was that now through the church, that's through you and me, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. There's a wisdom that you carry, and Jesus' purpose is that you and me manifest this wisdom and that it's recognized in the spirit realm. That powers and principalities see the wisdom of God on our lives. And they know, ooh, I can't mess with that business because it's functioning on kingdom citizenship 
I can't touch it. There's no law against that. I cannot get a foothold on that because they're functioning by the wisdom of God. My question to you is, are you recognized in the spirit realm? You see, there are different levels of knowing. Do you remember the time in the book of Acts, around about Acts chapter 9, the sons of Sceva, they had been checking out, they were sons of a priest, right? They'd been checking out Paul doing these amazing miracles, right? People were being healed, just whatever had come into contact with his garments. People would take them, people were being delivered, all sorts of things were happening. And these guys were like, we also want this thing. So they thought to themselves, let's go and try and cast out demons, right? And then they say, we call you out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. How many of you know that spiritual authority is birthed in intimacy? So these guys are now functioning on secondhand revelation. And they say, according to the Jesus who Paul is preaching, we cast you out. And what did the demonized person do? The demonized person says, Jesus, I know. And that's the word in the Greek, gnosko, which is a knowing, like an intimate knowing, experiential knowing. I think that demon had been cast out of someone else by Jesus some time back, and maybe was now in someone else now. They, they knew this Jesus. Amen? And then I find it interesting. They say, Jesus, I know. And he says, and Paul, I recognize. It's a different word that's used there. Episteme in the Greek, it literally means to know about, to have knowledge about something. So Jesus I know experientially, Paul I've been told about. So maybe his other gang of demonic spirits, they'd be like, hey, you know what, be careful of that guy. <laughs> but you, who are you? Let me, let me explain to you what often happens. Sometimes you can walk into a room and if you know your authority and you're carrying the wisdom of God and walking in that authority, you'll find demons already manifesting before you've even said anything to them, because they know you, or they recognize you. But other times you go and you're ministering deliverance to someone, and you can see that this demon is trying you out. And this demonic spirit is like, let's see if this person really knows the thing, because I haven't heard of him. <laughs> and that's exactly what is going on here. My question to you is the wisdom that you carry, is it recognized in the spirit realm? And the way it's recognized is you would have had a season of building according to that wisdom that is supernatural and not demonic. Amen. Amen. Let's go a bit deeper into this. Let's go a bit deeper into this. Number three, we have access to supernatural wisdom through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us this wisdom. In 1998, a friend of mine who's now pastoring a church in Berlin, Gareth Lowe, he said, Paul, you know what? I believe that this scripture is a life scripture for you. Isaiah 11 verse 2. Pray for it daily. Pray over it, over your life with this particular scripture. And regularly I pray this over my life. I encourage you to do the same. It says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Talking about Jesus. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. Wisdom is a spirit. That's why people can't teach you wisdom. You can't, oh, I, I learned to be wise from so-and-so. Wisdom is something that is imparted. Wisdom is a spirit. You can't say, I'm full of the Holy Spirit, but you're a foolish person. Because part of being full of the Holy Spirit is you're also full of wisdom because he's the spirit of wisdom. Amen? So don't, don't be a foolish Christian who says, I'm full of the Spirit, I'm full of the Spirit, but you're unwise. It means you're not tapping into the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Okay, it says here, and this is so powerful, it says here, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. And the first thing stated about the spirit is the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Isn't that powerful? In Luke chapter 12, verse 11 to 12, it says, when you are brought before the synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how to defend yourselves. One of the key things that short circuits the Holy Spirit from teaching us his wisdom is when we worry about how we're going to defend ourselves, when we worry about what we're going to say. Because it says here, do not worry about what you're going to say. I think it's very powerful, right? And how to defend yourselves or what to say for at that time, not three weeks before necessarily, but at that time, the Holy Spirit will do what? Will teach you what you should say. 
One of the ways of increasing the activity of the Holy Spirit in your life is being open to revelation from the Spirit of God. Amen? He loves it. The moment we position, we say, teach me, teach me, what should I say? What should I say? He comes, and we see a Holy Spirit dynamic around us because we're open to His wisdom. Amen? Amen. I remember an experience where I was coaching someone from the city of Tswane, one of the leaders there, and he said to me, Paul, you know what? I, I think I'm in trouble with the mayor. This was a couple of years ago. I think I'm in trouble with the mayor. I don't know. I think I might be in trouble. Uh, can you just help me? How do I prepare for a session with the mayor where I think he's going to reprimand me about certain things? And I thought to myself of the concept, how do you prepare for a bashing session with a mayor? I mean, who thinks of that? I didn't know what to say, but I opened myself to God's wisdom. And there and then, I was saying to him various things, and I came up with about 10 points. I had to take notes on myself. What was happening? The Holy Spirit was teaching me what to say as I was saying it. How many of you have had that experience? I then, I then did the talk again, and I recorded it just by myself and so on. And that's one of the talks where people came to me after saying, oh, that talk where you were talking about how to prepare for a bashing session. Oh, it was so powerful. Oh, that talk. What is happening there? I was relying on his wisdom, not on my wisdom. Amen. And in that process, that guy then says to me, I just want to show you because it increased the Holy Spirit's activity. And that guy then says to me, and Paul, Paul, I don't want just leadership coaching from you. I also want the spiritual aspects, please. I need to grow on the spiritual aspects. I said, are you saved? Have you given your life to the Lord? He says, no. He says, no, I've been a bit religious here and there in the past, but I'm not born again. And he gave his life to the Lord. Yeah. Amen. But what triggered that? What triggered that? What triggered that Holy Spirit dynamic? It's where you're broken before God and you're not trusting in your own wisdom. Amen. All right. Something else um, that Sir Francis Bacon said, he says, there's a difference between happiness and wisdom. He that thinks himself the happiest man is really so. But he that thinks himself the wisest is generally the greatest fool. So the type of wisdom I'm talking about, it's not like where you strut around saying, I'm a wise man. Ah, I'm a wise man. Hey, yeah, I know wisdom. Hey, you know, just pause on that because we are wise. I'm not talking about that type of wise, wisdom. In the book of James, it tells us that the wisdom from above is humble. There's a brokenness to it. There's a sense of, God, I cannot lead these people. Give me your wisdom, please. And then you're open to a dimension that causes you to build. Amen. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 19 to 20, it says, But when they hand you over, do not worry about how to respond or what to say. In that hour, not 10 days before. Sometimes God can speak to you 10 days before. But in this context, he's saying, In that hour, you'll be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. I have to ask myself, would I rather be the one speaking or the spirit of my father speaking through me? When you're there in your family, say to yourself, what is God's heart for my wife? What is God's heart for my husband? What is God's heart for my kids? And let me represent him and wash them with his words, not my words. That's where the power is. And the degree to which we speak his words will be the degree to which we walk in spiritual authority on this earth. Amen? You see, God is, God is searching. The Bible says he's searching to and fro, to and fro, looking at who he can be strong on behalf of. Isn't that powerful? But how do we qualify? Because sometimes he looks around and doesn't find anyone. He's looking for a broken and contrite heart. He says, I will not deny that. I will not despise that. And this is a heart that's saying, God, I'm open to carrying your heart. God, I'm open to carrying your burdens. How many of you know that in intercession, if you're carrying your own burdens, you disqualify yourself from carrying the burdens of the Lord? Amen? It's easy to pray... When you're open to carrying the burden of the Lord, then you pray through the burden. But a lot of times we're carrying our own burdens. And so he can't pray through us. Are you hearing me this morning? All right? I don't know about you, but I want to carry his words. I want to be a conduit of his words. But I have to nullify my own words in order to do that. Amen. Okay. I find it interesting. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, to one is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. You know what it's talking about here? Some translations say, to one is given the word of wisdom. You know that one word of wisdom can change your life. One word of wisdom. 
I remember coaching someone in a particular bank. The person was in treasury, and they were in middle management, and very clever person. And they said to me, Paul, I want to be promoted. But what's happened is that this other person has now got the job, right? And this was a colleague of hers. And she said, you know what, but Paul, I can't report to that person. I'm going to have to report to them. I can't. I teach this person things, right? This person doesn't pitch up for certain meetings. The Lord then gives me a word of wisdom for this lady. And I said, keep your heart pure before God because promotion comes from the Lord. And what I'm seeing over you is I see you skipping multiple positions. That's what I'm seeing happening. And I'm not exaggerating. What happened was she initially made a lateral move because she couldn't report to that other individual. But within a matter of months, the CEO of that group basically said, come for tea. I would like you to be the CEO of this division within that banking group. You know what happened? She received a word of wisdom. Amen? Some of you, God is giving right now words of wisdom for your own lives. Radical strategies. You know, I found myself uh, with, with my, the books that I've done and so on, I found myself in a situation where the people who print them, they're Christians, and um, they, they, they own the printing company, and they were praying for me. And one of them, a lady called Esme, she says, Paul, I'm not just seeing books here, I'm also seeing games. I took that as a word. And stemming from that, I started to design card games that I use in the workshops that I do. People come to me and say, People are in tears when I show them my emotional trigger cards and things like that, and we use those exercises. It was something that was birthed based on a word of wisdom. Amen? For some of you, God is going to be giving you dreams, and you'll start businesses birthed by that dream that God gives you. Because you're not doing it stemming from your own wisdom, but wisdom from above. Are you hearing me this morning? It's a supernatural wisdom, and once you function in that, no one can take it away from you. What I find amazing in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, it says, But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. If you study that passage of Scripture, it says, No one knows a man except the Spirit of the man. No one knows Philip except His Spirit. Amen? And then it goes on to say, No one knows God except the Spirit of God, but we have the Spirit of God. You know what that shows me? You can know God. You can have a revelation of all the hidden riches of wisdom and understanding of counsel and might because we have the Holy Spirit. As I draw towards an end, I want to share with you a powerful principle. It's number four. Supernatural wisdom cannot be resisted. Some of you are in situations in your life where you talk and talk and talk, but no one hears what you have to say. You talk and talk and talk, and your words just fall to the ground. If you look at the prophet Samuel, the prophet Samuel, the Bible says, Samuel was appointed a prophet by God. And as a result, he was established as a prophet and he was recognized in all of Israel. And it says, none of his words failed. Some translations say, none of his words fell to the ground. In prophetic language, what that means is that everything that he decreed, everything that he stated came to pass. You will make decrees that will always come to pass because you'll not just be speaking your words, you'll be speaking God's words. Amen. Spirit-led words. We see this in the life of Stephen. It says in Acts chapter 6 verse 10, but resistance arose from what was known as the synagogue of freedmen, including Cyrenians, Alexandrians, etc. They began to argue with Stephen. How many people have been argued against? People have argued against you. But look at verse 10. It says, but they could not stand up to his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. They could not resist, some translations say, his wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. My question to you this morning is, by what wisdom are you speaking? By which spirit are you speaking? Some of you are in situations where you will go from here and You'll go to places where you've been rejected in terms of certain business deals. And this time you will go and you'll speak with a boldness and an authority. And they will not be able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which you speak. Some of you will be addressing family situations and you will address them with a new boldness and a new authority. And those who used to resist you, they will now come and they'll say, tell us, explain to us, what should we do?
Number five, supernatural wisdom is the building material of the kingdom. Proverbs 24 verse 3 says, By wisdom a house is built, and through understanding it is established. You can build a house, but the house still needs to be established. Some of you have got jobs in this country, but you're not yet established like Samuel was. You're not yet established in the nation. Please hear me. There's an establishing anointing that God wants to release this morning. If you're double-minded about, should I be here or should I not? Should I be in Cape Town or should I be in Joburg? That confuses things in heaven. The Bible tells us that a double-minded man is unsteady, unstable in all his ways and should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. So if you're going to God and you're double-minded, don't expect that prayer to be answered. Because God is saying to you, what do you want? God wants to establish you and you're established as you pray strong prayers, clear prayers, saying, God, this is it. Establish me in the land. It's one thing to build. It's another thing to establish. We're built up with wisdom. We're established with understanding. Wisdom and understanding are similar, but not exactly the same thing. Ask God to give you revelation on that. I'm not going to go further into that. Number six, supernatural wisdom applies to all of life. What happened with Daniel? Daniel and his friends were not just given wisdom in terms of the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. Daniel and his friends, the Bible tells us, it says that Daniel, it says, as for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. In every branch of literature and wisdom. I decree over you right now, that in your industry, the Lord Jesus is imparting to you every bit of understanding of your industry, every bit of understanding of the sphere of influence he has called you to, where you'll be like a Daniel where they said they were 10 times better than the magicians of Babylon. God is making you 10 times better. Why? Because he's giving you his wisdom. It applies to all of life. And finally, number seven, supernatural wisdom establishes your influence. One of the most influential people ever in a nation was Joseph. What I find interesting is Joseph says something in Genesis chapter 47. He addresses a particular thing. I'm going to read 41 because of time. Genesis chapter 41. He says to the Pharaoh, now you should choose some man with wisdom and insight and put him in charge of the country. What's the qualification to be in charge of a country? Wisdom and insight. And he says that, and I think when he says that he's being a bit cheeky because he knows that that's him. He knows in terms of wisdom and insight, he's, he's above everyone else. And he explains what they should do. And this was the response. And they said to him, to them, we will never find a better man than Joseph, a man who has God's spirit in him. Can you see the link between wisdom and God's spirit? Joseph says, find someone with wisdom and insight. They say, we won't find anyone better than Joseph who has God's spirit in him. What's one of the signs of having God's spirit in you? Wisdom and insight. And, it, and isn't this phenomenal? The king said to Joseph, God has shown you all this. So it is obvious that you have a greater wisdom and insight than anyone else. I will put you in charge of my country. Ask of me and I will give you the nations. How do we inherit nations? We need wisdom. I'll put you in charge of my country. Some of you are going to be put in charge of businesses. People who own businesses, I'm prophesying now, please receive it. People who own businesses are going to come to you and say, please, you've got such wisdom and insight. The Spirit of God is all over you. Come and run my business. Come and run my business. Come and run my business. Some of you will be running schools because of the wisdom of God on your life. If you're here this morning and you're saying, please, let this thing be imparted. Let this thing be activated. I want to function in a supernatural dimension of wisdom like never before. That's a request that pleases the Lord. 
I just want you to stand up if you're here and you're saying, I want this prayer. Wisdom is a spirit. Wisdom can be imparted, it can be activated. Father, I thank you for the spirit of wisdom in this place. Father God, I thank you for the activation of angels on behalf of the people of God here. I thank you, God, that by your spirit, you're taking from Jesus and you are giving to us so that we may apply the knowledge that we have, all the things that we've been taught in this wonderful church. Father, I pray for an acceleration. Lord, I ask that those whose minds have been besieged by the enemy, those who've been hindered in functioning according to wisdom, I rebuke every hindering spirit. I rebuke every spirit that causes limitations. Right now, it is being broken off you in the mighty name of Jesus. You are being unleashed to another dimension. I pray, Father God, for your people who are writing exams this coming year, who are studying courses this coming year. May they be like a Daniel, Lord, who was blessed with the wisdom and understanding of what is going on in the language and literature of Babylon. I thank you, God, that you're raising up statesmen in our midst, Lord. I thank you that you're raising up family men and women. I thank you, God, that the spirit of wisdom is resting upon us, Lord, in how to disciple our children, how to discipline them, how to love our wives. I thank you, God, for the people who are single, that they will build according to your wisdom, Lord, even in finding the right person for themselves. I thank you, God, that the manifold wisdom of God is manifesting in our midst even right now, and we choose to build upon this wisdom. We renounce the other types of wisdom, wisdom, Lord. We renounce all the isms in our lives, and we choose to embrace the wisdom that is from above. We pray this prayer. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, if you receive that, just clap for Jesus. God bless you. Thank you.